This is an SM Media production. Hi folks and welcome to our SM Media Euro 2024 preview show. I'm Scotty Pike. It is an absolute pleasure to be your host as always. And we are finally here. We've been plugging it for months. Our Euro 2024 shows are starting and they will continue going forward from this. For our preview show, I think we've got a better panel than the BBC and ITV could muster up here. I think we've got an all-star panel to, to discuss. We've got different cultures, different varieties different experts as well. So without further ado, let's just go around the panel and introduce them all. First of all, you'll recognise them from various shows on the network, such as the Premier League and Pro Wrestling Show and the Rangers Assessment. It is a pleasure to welcome, as always, Scott Young. Yeah, no, looking forward to this one. Happy to be here. As always, I kind of just get dragged in whenever you need a host. So, no, I'm looking to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to having you on as well. And obviously, our, one of our two Scotland experts, well, three if you include me, but I wouldn't consider myself an expert. Uh, as well, joining us, can I represent in Scotland? You'll recognise him from World Football Index. Obviously, he was he was on the show previously at the last Euros. We've had him on in the past. It is a pleasure to welcome Callum McFadden. Pleasure to be back, Scott. Really looking forward to it. And as you say, you've got a, a great panel tonight. So looking forward to being part of it. Absolutely. Representing Hungary, giving us a wee bit of a, an expertise into Scott, one of Scotland's three group opponents, and obviously offering us a different kind of variety on kind of Hungarian football, and they were telling us a bit more about other teams as well. It's a pleasure to welcome Kevin McCluskey. Right, cheers, Scott. Thanks very much for having me here today. Really looking forward to you know joining the panel and getting involved in the discussion. Absolutely, yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on, Kevin. Representing the Blue Podcast, representing England. A man who'll be wanting 58 years of heart to come to an end. It is a pleasure to welcome Tom McLeave. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I look forward to talking about this, and I'm sure you Scots are probably not going to agree with some of my opinions on England, but uh, I'm looking forward to the chat. It's a real pleasure to have you on. And finally, representing the defending champions, the person who's going to give us the, the all the lowdown on the Italians and what they, what we can expect from them as they defend the trophy. It's a pleasure to welcome Nima Taveli Rizzari. Good to be with you guys. Hope everyone's well. Very well. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. And I think the Euros is obviously one of the kind of big tournaments we all look forward to. It comes around once every four years. It's a perfect sandwich between the World Cups. It was a very, very good tournament three years ago when we badly needed it, when there was no football on. I'm going to just get around the panel and kind of ask what the tournament means to them and their favourite Euro memory. So we'll start with Scott. What's your favourite Euro memory and what does the tournament mean to you? I feel like I might get kicked out here by someone that if I say Saka's penalty miss. But, like, I w- obviously being Scottish, you don't want England to win it. And I feel like so being against England that last tournament, it, the final couldn't have gone any better. By them scoring the first five minutes, thinking it's coming home and all that home tournament as well, they get beat by they get beaten penalties, and as you can see the Spurs stuff, an Arsenal player missing the deciding penalty, I feel like it couldn't have gone any better for me. So it'd be bad if I said England losing the last Euros, but as a Scotsman, you don't really get a lot of good memories in these tournaments. Obviously, you probably may if Scottish could maybe say the draw the draw at Wembley, but. I don't really count draws as good things. But overall, and for tournament, yeah, I mean, to, over the tournament as a whole, I just love a summer. Uh, summers are boring because transfer windows, transfer windows down now. It's just a bunch of rumours until something concrete comes. But any tour, any summer, where it's like three games a day. It's a lot. I, I love watching any kind of football, finding it, watching different players, finding different players like. One that think springs to mind, James Rodriguez in the World Cup. Just finding, but obviously you kind of heard of him, but finding out, a t- watching a top player and finding out, finding out about him because of international football, 
just things like that, yeah. Euros and international football as a whole over the summer when there's no club football, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't I, couldn't I agree more. Callum, what about yourself in terms of kind of favourite Euro memories? I know one that sticks out for me was 2012 when Spain, we just saw, I think 2008 was the beginning of, of this kind of Spain revolution, but I thought 2012, Spain, I thought that, that was the best. I, I, was, I think that's the best team I've ever seen, that international team. I think for me, the one that I would pick out would be Greece winning in 2004, just because I think it was obviously an incredible story. Um, I recently watched the, the film about Otto Ray Hagel, King Otto, and I thought that was a, a fantastic piece of film that, that reflected obviously on, on the kind of magnitude of that achievement. So I would pick that one just for the shock factor in the sense that obviously Portugal were the hosts, all eyes were, were on Portugal to, to, to go into that final and win it in home soil. And, you know, Greece defied all the odds to get to the final, beating France and others along the way. And then, you know, they were able to do it again in the final, which I thought was was phenomenal. And when you think of football, you know, that year, obviously, Mourinho wins the, the Champions League with Porto, Greece winning the Euros, you know, it's the sort of underdog stories we don't really see at the elite level of football too often anymore. Kevin, what about yourself? I mean, there's there's a lot like Euro '96. Obviously, there was a, kind of I think brought football back into the mainstream. Kind of certainly in that over here, like obviously 2004, as Carl mentioned, there's a lot of really good tournaments to stand out. What kind of stands out for you? I'm really going to go for Euro '96 actually, um, and like like Scott said earlier on, you know, being Scottish, we don't really get very many moments to celebrate in these tournaments. So it's the it's beating Switzerland. You know, that's probably, like, I remember things like Italian 90, but I was too young to really appreciate the tournaments. And 96 is probably, like, that coming-of-age tournament that I've watched. I've seen Scotland win a game. It was great. I got that naive feeling, though, that we were actually going to do that more often. So uh, that came back to bite me a little bit. But that was that's a big memory, you know, seeing Scotland win a game there. And then I think probably, like, a more of a personal one was... I was at the Hungary France game at the last Euros, um, but directly behind the goal when Fiola scores Hungary's first goal in the tournament, and the noise when that ball hit the back of the net, it was something else. So that's uh, that's like a memory I don't think I'll forget for a while. Very Tom, obviously Scott's kind of fairly kind of made clear what his favourite memory was. Like in terms of England, like. There was a generation with England where you felt as if they should win it, and then there was a quiet period, and now you're kind of at that stage again. Kind of in terms of England, where does kind of memory stand out for you? I mean, it probably is that sure goal in in my lifetime. That that kind of moment where we thought we could do it. Uh, obviously, this England, so we we love heartbreak at the end of the day. Um, um, but yeah, it was probably just being with kind of my family and family friends when that short goal went in and, you know, kind of everyone had celebrated very wildly, probably a bit too soon. It was only five minutes into the game, but um, it was just that kind of, for a long time, we thought we had a very, very good opportunity of actually, you know, <laughs> not being heartbroken every time we go to a, a tournament. Um, the, the The golden generation was... I was a bit bit young to fully appreciate. I think at the time, I've heard lots of stories from my my dad and uh, my grandfather about about that. And you know, year ninety six as well, more heartbreak, but a lot of happy moments for a, a lot of England fans. But yeah, you know, for me, the the short sure goal was probably the best mo memory. But obviously, it's slightly soured uh, as the game went on. <laughs> Nima, obviously, three years ago, Italy did do it. I it's kind of a funny one because Italy, I think a lot of people thought they were kind of going under the radar, but there's more as a tournament went on, you could see that they kind of were the stand outside. But does that kind of stick out for you, like World Cups as well? Like in terms of the Euros, was three years kind of the, the big point for you as an Italian fan? Well, I mean, as an Italian football fan, yes, because the biggest heartbreak is Euro 2000, of course. I mean, that yeah. that's the one that Italy should really have won. Um, but you know, the, the Italy were favourites uh, going into that tournament three years ago, and and I remember even you know when it was postponed due to the pandemic, um, they were favourites even then, and I was one hundred percent sure they were going to win the Euro twenty twenty. Um, so I was very confident going into uh, the Euros three years ago. I was expecting Italy to to win it because they had the best central midfield in the world at the time with Jorginho Verratti and Barella. Um, 
But um, my earliest, I probably have to go with Euro '92, um, which uh, was in Sweden in Gothenburg when I was a kid, and I I lived in Gothenburg. I'm from Gothenburg, so having the Euros come into your hometown um, like that, and 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 you know everything, the circus that was Euro '92, was um, was 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 very memorable. But of course, yeah, I mean it has to be three years ago when Donnarumma saves that penalty and, and and Italy finally win it um having only won it once before I mean they should have won like I said they should have won it in 2000 Del Piero had so many chances uh, which he squandered and of course one mistake Toldo makes all tournament mm -hmm. is Will Tord equalizing and that's when the game is over essentially yeah absolutely but we'll we can I get everybody's thoughts and I can own size later on but Callum Scott we'll we'll get your kind of thoughts first it's very rare that we can talk about we can talk about a tournament and actually have a personal investment. So Scotland are there. Scotland made it very, very good in qualifying. Obviously, some memorable results against Spain and Norway away in particular. Scott, in terms of Scotland's chances, in terms of what they did in qualifying to now, it's it's been a very, very enjoyable period for Scottish football, which has been very rarely the case. And it just feels good to have a team that's that's going in to, to a major tournament on the back of a good campaign? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, to qualify with one game to go, I don't think if I don't think anyone saw that coming. I think we all kind of had a chance. I think we all in small part of our head thought we had a chance, but then we saw Spain, obviously Spain, the top team, always going to be a top team of top players. Obviously, he's on Norway with Odegaard and Haaland, players like that, you think, may could can't we might have a chance. But no, I'm very, very happy to... Obviously, be here. I would. I feel. I feel more confident if we didn't. Have, if we didn't play between qualifying now, but the sort of friendlies and the sort of warm up games hasn't shown me what I wanted to see going into this team. And obviously, the injuries, Ferguson being out, Hickey being out, and Patterson being out. See, Hickey and Ferguson, you're probably looking at two starters there. Obviously, Dykes as well. Don't know if Dykes would have been a starter, but a good option to have. Having those kind of players that are injured, not as confident as I was, but come. The gym, to come to Germany game, at the moment I'm just buzzing to be there and buzzing to have a personal investment and come to Germany game, I think we'll end up with, if come to Germany game I just think we're going to win the full thing, because that's what football fans are like Callum, I had the pleasure of being at the, the Czech Republic game three years ago and I remember there just being a brilliant feeling because it was the first game in what, 25 years or 23 years since we'd been at a tournament and then obviously that sheet goal, it just felt like the kind of I, I felt, even though there was only about 8,000 in Hamden that day you just felt there was an utter deflation. And then after that, they go to Wembley and, and get a point. And then it obviously goes to Croatia. But I I feel this is a this is the this feels like a proper tournament. I, I didn't have the feeling that that this was a that two that three years ago, although we won against Serbia and kind of got there. We it didn't feel like a tournament because it wasn't a, I thought the the kind of twelve different cities was a bit of a nonsense anyway. But this feels like a tournament. We're going to Germany, we opened the tournament. So it says qualifying was so good, but injuries are a worry. Like there's, there's Scott says a few players in like missing. Like Hickey would have started, Ferguson would have been a great option, Dykes would have been a good option. It's been kind of in terms of the kind of players we have as well. We've got a very good crop of players, probably the best we've had in a long time. But between the final of final days of qualifying to now, it's it's not been an easy journey. No, it's not been an easy journey and the only thing I would say that maybe gives me more confidence uh, going into this um, is the fact that obviously the late Craig Brown was a great qualifier of tournaments when he was Scotland manager and uh, Craig's record in friendlies, to be honest with you, wasn't particularly great but obviously he was able to get us to tournaments and, and be competitive when we got there so, you know, for me, I think, yes, you want to win those friendlies um, that you've been playing, you know, since the, the qualification was secured. But at the same time, it's an opportunity to obviously try different things, play different players. Obviously, the game against Finland recently, it was more of a, an emotional occasion because Steve Clark wanted to give Craig Gordon his 75th cap. And again, if that was a competitive game, you're, you know, you're not going to be changing goalkeeper with 25, 30 minutes to go. So um, I'm confident in the sense that you know, the burden of not qualifying for so long was against Scotland, but the fact that we were able to qualify for Euro 2020, obviously it was delayed, but the fact we were able to get there, yes, it was a bit of a, a, a bitter experience in terms of how things went with that Czech Republic game and the Croatia game, as you say, aside from that good point at Wembley, but 
the players that we've got, the vast majority of them in that squad um, have got the experience, obviously, of playing at that European Championship. For them, as you alluded to, Scott, this is the first, I suppose, what you would call, quote-unquote, a real tournament in the sense that they're actually leaving the UK to go and play these games. They're going to Germany, whereas last time, obviously, they were... I think they were based at Middle, in Middlesbrough, I believe, yeah. and obviously they were playing at Hamden and Wembley. So they're going abroad, they're getting the full sort of um, traditional Euros experience. And we've got players in the squad that, you know, play at big clubs. You've got Andrew Robertson um, at Liverpool, of course, Scott McTominay, John McGinn just qualified for the Champions League with Aston Villa. I agree with you, the likes of Lewis Ferguson, who's had a, a fantastic season in Serie A, would have been a, a great option to have if it wasn't for injury. But, you know, I think we do have enough experience in the squad that, we can go into this with greater confidence than we did last time. That being said, no Scotland team in history has ever qualified from the group um, to reach the knockout phase. So, you know, that ceiling's got to be smashed eventually, and I don't see why this team can't potentially do that, especially with the third-place teams having a chance of qualifying. Neymar, I want to get your thoughts particularly on Lewis Ferguson, because obviously like, he, he's been superb for Bologna this season, and I know Thiago Mota has raved about him and I know his injury was a really bad one that I think Bologna mm. really struggled with. Like how how impressed were you with, with Lewis Ferguson? Obviously Aaron Hickey before that as well that had, mm. had been in Bologna. How impressed were you with the kind of Scottish boys that have Well I also that? really I thought Josh Doig was really yeah. good at Hellas Verona as well. Um no the Scot the Scottish players have been doing really well in the Serie A these last few years. Liam Henderson of course at Empoli before that. No, it's um I was imp- I was very impressed. Um he he was being linked to all the big clubs in Italy um before this injury and he was very important for Bologna. Um but uh, it was it was one of those seasons where they had so many impressive players young players taking stride like Joshua Zirkse, uh, Calafiori. Um, so no, uh, he he was been he's been one of the one of Bologna's mo- most important players. There's no doubt about that. And this injury was absolutely devastating for him and for Bologna. Yeah, and for Scotland as well, because I think he would have been a superb option coming off the bench. Kevin, I know you'll have a bit of a I can a strange investment in this because we can I'm Hungarian expert, but I know there'll be a party you can want in Scotland to to do well as well. From a Hungarian perspective, what's your kind of thoughts in Scotland? Like, are they kind of level to Hungary or do you th- like how are you can how how are Hungarians approaching Scotland in this group? I well first of all there's no split loyalties for me going into this tournament in Scotland all the way. <laughs> um I don't I'll be uh, I'll be the lone blue jerseyed man in a sea of red I'm sure in the when we when we face Hungary in that final game. So nah, no split loyalties there. But how the Hungarians view Scotland uh they give us a lot of respect I think because I think they see. I think they, they they think that they're a better team than us. To be fair, they do believe that they that they'll be the strongest side going into the game. But the Premiership gets a lot of coverage. Both actually the English and Scottish Premierships get a lot of coverage in Hungary. So guys like Andy Robertson, Scott McTominay, John McGinn, they're uh, they're in the the mindset of the Hungarian players and and fans. They know that they're good players. Guys like Callum McGregor as well will be there. That's got Champions League experience, so I think there's, I think there's a healthy respect for Scotland, but at the same time, Hungary's gone through a great last couple of years, and they're going in with big confidence that that they'll qualify from the group. So, have you got an interest in England, uh, Scotland this summer? Um, I think the group's really interesting with um, everyone that's in it. I do think Germany will be comfortably first in that group. Uh, with Scotland, but I'm really intrigued to see between Scotland, Hungary and Switzerland who will get through. And I do think a lot of people don't actually know the answer to that, which is the beauty of football and the Euros. Um, see, we don't have as much animosity against Scotland as you guys do against us. So I'm not, I wouldn't be against you guys getting through, you know, home nation and all that. Um but no, I'm I'm definitely intrigued. It's, it's definitely a group to keep an eye on because I think that that second spot is going to be really, really interesting for sure. Right, I'm going to throw it to, to Scott and Callum before we kind of move on to our sides. Scott, can Scotland qualify and what needs to happen for Scotland to qualify? I feel like, well, can Scotland qualify? I think the answer is yes. But I think to qualify... We need to beat Switzerland in a, in the first 
when after obviously Germany game, don't get bat don't get battered by Germany. If we come out with a one but we'll probably get beat, let's be completely honest. But if we come out with a one nil or a two one or a two nil, something like that, as long as it's not a cricket score, we've got the confidence to go into the Switzerland game. But to qualify we need to beat Switzerland. And for us not to for and as I said, we don't we cannot get battered by Germany. Getting beat by Germany is respectable and it's fine. But if we come out of that game four, five, six now, our confidence is and our confidence is shattered. So can Scott can Scotland qualify? Yes. And two qualify with eighty A beat Switzerland and B don't get battered by Germany. Callum, do you go along with that? It certainly need to win a game. You know, Portugal, of course, in, in 2016 were able to get through the group without winning a game. I don't see us drawing all three, if I'm honest with you. I think the Germany game is going to be a big ask, especially because the tournament's in Germany and it's the opening match. Um, you know, Switzerland will be a very tough game. You know, they've shown in tournaments gone by they can beat some of the best teams in the world. They, of course, famously beat Spain um, the year that Spain went on to win the World Cup. So, you know, they, they can cause an upset. And they are a team that are not to be taken lightly at all. So for me, yes, you have to win one of the games at the very least to have a chance of going through. Um, what will be easier out of Switzerland and Hungary? That's uh, the million dollar question. I think both of them, to be honest with you, will be very tough. Um, you know, both nations have got quality players, you know, some players under the radar as well that, of course, will probably come to the fore at this tournament as, as often is the case for, for, for all nations. So I think we have to win one of the games to, to stand a chance of going through and being realistic. I think our best chance of going through will be by being one of the best placed third um, place teams in the in, in the tournament. Whether we can do that is another matter, but I certainly feel more confident about this tournament than I did in the delayed Euros of three years ago. Right, moving on to one of Scotland's opponents, Hungary. Kevin, I get the feeling with Hungary at that I watched their game against Republic of Ireland and I know going into that match, I think they'd, they'd been unbeaten in the last 14 games. They'd obviously been very, very good against England. I think they were the, they were the 4 nothing away from home, I thought was was a real kind of turning point for, for England as well. This Hungary side are, are very, very eye-catching in terms of what they've done the past couple of years. And the way they did it in qualifying was impressive as well. Yourself, obviously, what what's your kind of thoughts? What's the kind of, kind of lowdown in Hungary in this tournament and what can we kind of expect from them? Yeah, so I, Hungary's definitely going into this tournament, like you said before, with a lot of confidence. Um, but I think they've only lost four games since the beginning of 2022. Uh, so there's like, they're definitely the form side in world football, you would say, regardless of the result and performance against the Republic of Ireland the other week. That was a kind of a, a freak game from their perspective because I think they really took it as, as a warm-up match. There was nothing in it, nothing at stake. Losing the game hasn't affected them in any way because they went out and thumped Israel 3 nothing on Saturday and they stopped playing at half-time because the game was over by then. Mm-hmm. So they're very confident going into the tournament. And I think what we'll see is a side that, um, that plays a really attacking, attractive style of football. Um, when Marco Rossi took over in 2018, Hungary was in the doldrums big time. They just had... The Belgian coach George Leakins in charge, and he only lasted four games. He was an absolute disaster. Rossi came in, just made them really solid and difficult to beat. And as his ten years gone on, he's been he's he's been fortunate that he's had guys like Soboslai coming through. He's had guys like Milos Kerkes, the left back. There's Andras Schaefer in the midfield. There's been a real kind of almost golden generation of Hungarian players who's come through again in the last few years, so he's been able to take his team away from being defensive-minded to being really quite attacking. And now, when you see them line up and they'll check on sofa score or something like that for the formation, and they'll be in 3-4-3, within five minutes, you're, you're sitting watching a team that's playing 2-3-5. You know, they're, they're really fluid in how they set up. So, like I say, I think they'll be... We'll talk about it later on, I'm sure, as well. But I, I actually think Hungary are one of the dark horses in the tournament. I'm not saying they'll go on and win it, but they've got potential that they could go deep into the tournament. You mentioned, obviously, Sober's line. I think he's obviously an interesting player to discuss because you look at their side and you think, like, in terms of main players, 
he stands out a lot. But there are a there are a good mix in there. Like I've always thought the defense is really solid as well. That can experienced heads like can I did really well at Euro twenty twenty as you say a few years ago. Like they've got a couple of good goal scorers as well. Like Salai as well. I've, I've been really impressed with in years gone by. Is is it kind of as the team kind of built round Sobers lie like and kind of the way like people will watch him at Liverpool for example like. How what's his kind of role? Is it different for, different to Hungary? Is there more freedom for him there? Yeah, there's a lot more freedom in the national team. So if you see him with, with Liverpool, he's probably got that left centre midfield role, and that's he mm-hmm. just stays there and does what Klopp asked him to do last season. With the national team, he might line up in left centre midfield, but he'll be at left back, right wing, number ten, dropping between the centre backs to take the ball. He's all over the place. He's got a proper like roving free role in there. Um, in the way that Rossi gets them to play now, they're, like I said, they're really fluid. So when he moves into one position, someone else comes in and covers where he was. Um, and the team is built around him because he's a fantastic player. Right? His passing range is great. He's a, he's a leader. He's able to drive the team on. So he's a, he's a hugely important player. And Looking at the group as well, and we'll, we'll can I get the thoughts in Germany can I later on? We'll can I get around the panel and ask about that? Like, the, the kind of form Hungary have been in, as you say, what they've done to England in the, the Nations League and the, the kind of way they've they've been pressing qualifying as well. I mean, their qualifying group was, wasn't was easy. I mean, they obviously had like Serbia in it as well, Montenegro. There was They did very well in that group. They didn't lose in eight games. What is the kind of expectations for Hungary in this tournament? Yeah, uh, expectations is that to get through the group. Um, they've got obviously the better chance because you can have the third qualifying place, but they're going for second place. I think that's that's the expectation level from them. Um, and I can't get through a section speaking about Hungary without mentioning the centre forward a guy called Barnabas Varga. Again, if we talk about players that kind of come under the radar and have a big tournament, I think he's one that will. He's maybe twenty nine years old now, but over the last couple of seasons, he's top scored in. Uh, well, NB2, the second division, and now NB1, got a move to Ferenc Varos last summer. Um, and he's replaced a guy called Adam Salai mm-hmm. up front, who was the talisman of the Hungarian team. And when he retired, there was a thought that like, there's not another number nine coming through. And then Vargas just kind of blossomed in the last couple of years. Goal scoring machine, someone again. Aside from soccer slides, someone that we'll need to watch out for in the in the final game. Yeah, absolutely. We're we're all kind of interested to to see what Hungary do. Tom, England now. I always think England perform better when there's no pressure. Like we've seen that in twenty eighteen. Always go back to that. They were phenomenal that in that campaign, and there wasn't a lot of expectations. I don't think there was a lot of expectations three years ago either, and they managed to to perform really well. This summer's a bit different, and there seem. I mean, the crop of talent in the forward line is is as good as I think I've ever seen from an England perspective. But there is a worry at the defensive line now, and to, starting with the attack, how exciting is it that you've got Phil Foden, Jude Bellingham, Harry Kane, Bakayo Saka, Declan Rice, and then you've got the likes of Ollie Watkins coming off the bench. You've got Cole Palmer. I mean, the, the attacking talent is frightening. Oh, no, the attacking talent's uh, probably giving uh, Southgate a bit of a headache, let's be honest. You know, do you start, do you bring in Palmer and put Bellingham into a into an eight role and then don't start Gallagher and, and Mainu? It's, and then, or, or do you drop Palmer and then start Gallagher and Mainu? It's, it's a good headache to have, um, definitely. It's just, you know, whether or not, Obviously, we didn't have Bellingham for the for the the two friendlies, and I think these friendlies also don't really show a huge picture because, I mean, I think only seven really of the starting team against um, that played the other day when we lost uh, against Iceland, which wasn't great. Um, it's, I think it's a good. I, I almost think that maybe it might have been a good kick up kick up the bum really losing to Iceland. You know, if we'd walked all over them then maybe people might put even more pressure on it. But it actually kind of showed the flaws in the system, flaws in our defence, obviously. Um, and the fact that, I mean, we were kind of playing a lot of players who haven't really played together. 
you know, Palmer's never played with any of those players before. Um, Eze's not played with any of these players before. Uh, Gordon's hardly played with them. Um, so in terms of these young players, it, there's a lot of potential there. We all know they're phenomenal players and some of the best in, in the Premier League. But um, it, it's it's getting it right with the attack because sometimes it's sometimes you have too many good players and you know egos can cause an issue. And you see with some some teams who have more you know less. At like they have still got elite players, but there's the odds kind of system player, and sometimes those teams will do better because kind of they're playing more as a team, and it's I think it's a big worry for England is can these players play together? Which is again with the golden generation uh, in the noughties, like can these can this midfield of skulls, uh, Lampard and Jarrett, can they play together? The answer was no, obviously. Um, so that is that is an issue. And in terms of the defense. We don't know who's starting. <laughs> let's be honest, as an England fan, what I should think... I do? What should I do? Defense, obviously. Like, I think, I think there will be an, an expectation shock in play at some point. Now, I don't think that will be at the start, but I mean, what is the ideal defense, and then the position in front of that? Because I, Scott will tell you, I've, I think we've both been in record in the Premier League show saying that if England are to win the tournament, then I think Declan Rice is the most important player because the amount of work he is going to have to do. To mm. cover that position, but I mean, I don't think Manu will be starting after that night, and that's not a knock against Manu. I just don't think he suits, and I think he's too young to have that yeah. sort of pressure. But I think the two, two, I think the kind of two big positions that we we kind of don't know about who partners Stones and yeah. who plays that sixth position. Who who would you go for? Like, who... If we're playing Bellingham in the ten, I think you start. Just for that little bit extra experience, you start Gallagher, and also he's a workhorse. Mm -hmm. As you said, you know Rice is going to have a lot to do in this Euros tournament. You need someone else who has the fitness for the full. Well, he might not play the full ninety. Don't get me wrong, but he has the fitness to run and run and run in the full ninety. And as I was saying, he's more of a system player. He's more of a player who does the the hard stuff. And as a Chelsea fan, I've watched him all season. I think he's been brilliant, and it's the stuff he does off the ball that actually has made him a better player. And then in partnering Stones, I think we all thought it'd be Maguire, but obviously he's had that calf injury, so that's put him out. Um, I would have loved to have Tamori in the squad, but I do sometimes think Southgate doesn't watch the Italian league. And um, But I think I think he's leaning on Gerhi, uh, obviously Chelsea products. I think he's been fantastic at Palace since he joined them. Another player I've slightly wish we'd held on to but um <laughs> Chelsea's Chelsea um but I, th I think it's go he's he's the makes makes the most sense he is a left-sided center back generally for Palace um and I, in terms of the fullbacks as well I think the fullbacks is still up for debate you know do you start concert or Trippier on the left both aren't left backs but with sure obviously going but not fully fit yet I mean he hasn't played a minute really in a long time um and then on the right is it trent or walker um i'm leaning at trent right now actually because if we're playing palmer or saka on the right they cut in so much you need someone else to fill that kind of crossing position and let's be honest it's probably not a better cross with the ball than than trent right now so that's probably my ideal situation i think in terms of, and I'll get everybody's thoughts in England, kind of just before we, we kind of move on to Italy. Like, what is what is the expectation? Like, kind of looking at it, we see, and I, I know, you know, we maybe look at it a bit differently, but we see a lot of talk in the media. I think the media sometimes don't help. But yeah. what is the expectation from a a point of view of this is a terrific uh, group of players. This is a group of players who are knocking on the door. As the manager going to get the credit if they do win because he'll certainly get the blame if they don't like what is the kind of feeling in Southgate now compared to what it was three, I five, think, three four years ago I think what Southgate needs to do and it's the thing that he is good at is getting these players playing for each other and mm -hmm. playing with each other and that's how we're going to win the tournament he's not going to be a tactical genius with his with how he plays everyone it's I think the the way he gets credited is if the players start playing with each other for each other, you know, wanting to link up link up. I think we've already seen that 
in kind of previous friendlies when Foden and Bellingham played, you could see that they were actually were trying to link up and play. And I know against um, Belgium and Brazil, you know, <laughs> we have to remember we've won one in our last five games, <laughs> England going into this tournament. And it's the first time I think in, yeah, 56 years going into the, going into a tournament, we've not won our last game before it, or at least the Euros. So yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a bit of a head scratcher as, as to who would get the blame. I do think Southgate would get a massive amount of blame if we don't do well. Um, on our podcast, we did go through every group, every quarterfinal, semifinal, and I think our, we should get out the group. And I think our toughest test will be in that semifinal, which I think will be Germany. Um, and that's probably going to make our break our tournament. If we get into that Germany game, having won every game, and we put a performance out against Germany, I have... I think a lot of England fans will have a lot of faith in England to to go the distance, having been there in the last tournament in the final. But I think every England fan is always compre- not, not very confident in any tournament, to be honest, because we've had we've had so many chances, and this isn't the first time we've had a a golden generation, so to speak, you know. So um, I think the expectation as an average England fan is at least the semi final, and then from there, I have no idea what happens. <laughs> to be honest has anybody in the panel got anything to say regarding England whether they think they can win it or not like, I'm going to just throw it out there to anybody just feel free to chime in anybody get anything they want to say about England well, can I want to speak uh, about what you said about the, about the midfield we've seen recently Trent playing next to Rice and I've said like for that. a while Trent in midfield's a myth it's a myth that some folk yeah. have decided on Twitter that he's a midfielder there's a reason Klopp rebuilt the midfield in the summer and Trent wasn't in it. So I think if England's best chance is having Gallagher next to Rice, so if he's got Trent next to Rice, obviously Trent's phenomenal in the ball football club, we all know that, but he's not a midfielder and I don't get where this myth about him being a centre mid is coming from. No, I agree. I think um, I think you could see the difference in how he played when he obviously started in that CDM role or the midfielder role. He just looked lost at points. He's very much out of position. You know, he's not used to it. And then you put him on the right wing and he's pinging balls across the pitch like he always does for Liverpool. Uh, much, much better. So I, th- I do think our best option is Gallagher. Unless, but I also do, don't mind the Bellingham in the eight role and maybe putting Foden or Palmer. Is it too early for Wharton? Pardon? Is it too early for Wharton to be in there? Because he's really yeah. stood out to me. It... <sighs> It's not, but it is. Mm-hmm. Like just just his cameos alone, he was he's been brilliant, and obviously he's been absolutely. Fun. I mean, he's changed Palace's midfield. Yeah, like if you look to the end of the season, he was unbelievable. Um, and then you know you could pose the question: Do you? Do you, uh, you probably wouldn't have Eze and him in a team at the same time. Maybe later on in the game, but he could he could be a great player to bring on. I think he probably will be more of an impact sub if he is used. And I think Manu didn't really do himself a lot of justice. I filled us with confidence in his last performance, really. He did look like he was a bit lost. So I do think it's too early for Wharton, but I mean, I'm excited for the future with him. He looks unreal. Yeah, I think I think so. I think there is that frightening amount of talent as well that we, we could see. But moving on to the, the defending champions, Neymar Italy, now, you look at Italy's side and I'm <clears> an <throat> avid follower of Italian football as I am. They are as a lot of differences between that team that won three years ago to now. They don't have the, the World Cup where we can look back on as a piece of form because they obviously didn't get there. But looking at the side in terms of, you mentioned obviously about Verratti not being there. I think Kellini and Benucci, there's a big difference in that side. What are the kind of big differences from three years ago to you regarding this team now? Oh, there's there's so much. The two central defenders, Bonucci, Chiellini, have retired. Verratti is kind of retired. Uh, he's not playing pro, you know, elite football anymore and he's no longer really being considered. Jorginho is not the player he was four, three, four years ago. Barella is probably Italy's only world-class player. Federico Chiesa suffered ACLs. Yeah. Zaniolo has had two ACLs. Um... The, the the striker position is probably the only position where it looks better 
uh, Skamaka is finally coming to his own. Um, but where, whereas three years ago, Ciro Immobile, it, it, Italy won the Euros without really having a real number nine. Um, but uh, no, there's there's a lots of concerns. I mean, the goalkeeping position looks great. Vicario, Donnarumma uh, are, are going to be brilliant, regardless of um, you know they're, they're going to just be awesome. Um, but the problem is with Di Lorenzo, for example. I mean, we don't even have a formation yet. Does he play a four three three? Does he play a three five two? He doesn't know. Does he play a three four two one? I mean, going into the tournament, you you have so many question marks, and you don't know what you're doing, and that's not a good place to be. Um, and so, of course, Acerbi got injured, mm-hmm. Tonali's ban, um, you know, Italy have really, 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 you know, Berardi's got injured. He was he was a starter in, in, in the opening game three years ago. Um, there's so many players that are injured or or, or out. Um, and Locatelli obviously was left at home due to technical reasons, as they say in Italy. So, no, it's the, 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 I'm not very confident at all. Um, this is um, this is not... Uh, I, I, I'm worried Italy don't even get out of the group, um, if I'm perfectly honest. But then again, I don't really, to be honest with you, I don't really care about the Euros. For me, this is more a, a dress rehearsal for the World Cup. Italy haven't been in the World Cup for such a long time mm-hmm. now that they have to focus on getting to the World Cup and they have to focus on doing well in the World Cup. Yeah. So Spalletti has to build um, towards that. Um, but a quarter final is what I think you should be asking of Italy. I think Pellegrini is a brilliant player. Um, Jorginho as well Fagioli is probably going to be there as well but um, he's going to start as well you know you have Fratesi of other players who are good but you don't have any world class players except for Bastoni and Donnarumma and, and, or, or if you can even count Donnarumma as a world class player but Barella Bastoni are the only ones and, and that's that's a problem because three years ago Italy had by far the best midfield in the world Yeah. Um, and it's nowhere near that now um, so I, I look at this tournament as a little bit more you know regen rejuvenation, learn each other, find a good, you know, because again, Destiny Udoji's missing. I mean, there's so many players Italy are missing. This is more a dress rehearsal for two years from now because it's the World Cup in 2026. That's when Italy have to do well. That's when Italy have to not only reach it, but they have to go through from the group stage and go far. I mean, that's that's the way I see it. And what is, like, obviously Spalletti took over after his, his job at Napoli and it's kind of been early days to suggest kind of where, where they're at, but What's the kind of been? What's been the kind of thoughts since Spalletti coming in? And you said about formation. I, I I've kind of looked at Italy's kind of formations. They've tried kind of four three three, and then kind of goes into like a four two three one, and they're focusing on a number ten who can kind of make plays. Like what? What do you kind of think of Spalletti so far? No, Spalletti took over in the middle of you know when when Mancini resigned, and it was mm-hmm. very complicated. Um, Mancini played a 4-3-3 Spalletti's always played a 4-3-3 4-2-3-1 hybrid but then he came to this Italy side and understood pretty quickly that he doesn't actually have any players to play like that and so he moved to a 3-4-2-1 um, and, and that was the wise decision of him to do because uh, you know the, the most important thing in a Spalletti system is the midfield trio and their movements and how they progress with the ball. Um, the back three is not, you know, and wing backs and, and the rest of it isn't that bad and it isn't really that imp- not as important as the midfield trio is. As for, and also if you look at the strikers that Italy have, Raspadori, Scamacca, Rettighi, um, uh, yeah, Rettighi, Scamacca, Chiesa, Raspadori, mm-hmm. um, these guys are, you know, Scamacca is the only real number nine there. Raspadori is more like a nine and a half. Um, Chiesa's a winger uh, who's who's had you know never been the same player after the injury. Uh, Retegi's a big guy, he's a killer in the box. Italy should play two strikers up front, and I, I hope they do. I hope they play a proper 3 5 2 against uh, Albania, um, and that they start with Retegi and Scamacca because Scamacca can create something out of nothing. Mm-hmm. He has that ability about him. And Retegui is a killer in the box. Di Marco on the left wing has an amazing left foot. His delivery and his crosses, passing, free kicks, corners, those are world class. But other than that, he he has defensive holes. Um, there are positional, there are question marks for his positional ability. He um, he can't dribble. He can't beat his man. Um, so so there are question marks. A lot of question marks going into this tournament for Italy. I'm not confident at all. Um, they have to beat Albania. If they don't, I really wonder if they go through because Spain and Croatia are looking really good, especially Croatia. And do you think that is like 
because I, I kind of kind of share the same concerns. Like I do think there's a real difference to the side, and I think that a balance. I think Asabi is a big a, a big mess as well. Like I think obviously losing him, he is. I was somebody going in three years ago. I was really telling people to keep an eye on because mm. he wasn't. I think Insigne is a big mess as well. Like that pace, no. having that pace, like. When you look at the the first game, obviously the first game as Albania, winning that is obviously vital. But how do you can kind of assess Spain and Croatia, and do you look at them as real dangers? Oh, absolutely! I think Croatia, their midfield is unbelievable. Maybe not as good as an attack in as in previous years. Mm-hmm. Um, and same thing with Spain. Uh, Morata isn't getting any younger, but he does his job, and they have fantastic talent in the middle of the pitch, uh, as they always do. They know how to retain possession. They know how to keep keep the, keep the ball in the team. Um, and, and I don't want Italy to go into those games having to chase the game. Yeah. It's important for Italy to get a result against Albania. They, if, once they've got the three points, that's fine. Then they can kind of go from there on. I think they have to treat every every single game as a cup final um, if Italy are to go far. Um, because um, they're, they're not favourites. This is not a team that's balanced. It's not. He's barely had any time to work on it. Um and and it's not worked. Um because uh, you know, Italy have been unlucky, very unlucky with injuries, very unlucky. And Tonali would have definitely been a starter yeah. as well because of this betting ban. So now Fagioli, who was banned and he hasn't played a minute pretty much, he he's been called up. Locatelli's been left out. I thought that's a weird decision. Um yeah, I mean th- there's 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 uh, there's there are lots of lots of question marks. Has anybody got anything in Italy they can want to ask Nima? Uh, do you do you think you can still get best of the rest at the best third place? Sorry, what? If I do you if think you guys could get the best third place and still make it through to the knockout? Well, yeah, I mean, if Italy don't go through the group, it'd be a it, it would be a disaster. But um, no, I think so. I think I think they have to beat Albania, and yeah. when they beat Albania, um, if they beat Albania, they will relax more, and then they can go into the games against Spain and Croatia and kind of be more play on the result kind of thing, um, which which they should be able to do. Um, but yeah, no, the, the key game is Albania. If they do not beat Albania and they go into Croatia and Spain chasing those games from the start, I, I don't see that ending well at all. Let's look into some of the main contenders. Obviously, we're just going to go around everybody and just get their, their thoughts on who they think could be the, the ones to beat in the tournament. Scott, I know you're very keen on the World Cup finalists. What's your thoughts going into France in this tournament? I just look at France and think there's hardly any weaknesses. If you look, if you go through their team player for player, it's like, you've got your Salibas in the midfield. Midfield's a joke. We are sure many Camavinga top players like that, and then you go up top. Obviously, there's not many players that are getting talked about more than Kylian Mbappe at the moment. Obviously, moving to the Madrid and whatever else. I just look at that France team and think, how do you beat them? I know, obviously, the obviously the Argentina done it in the, in the World Cup, but that was on penalties. The save in the last minute that's talk, still talked about to this day. I just look at France and think, what like how can anyone? What the weak? Uh, say people say, oh, every team in the world's got a weakness. I'm not quite sure what France is, and if all those players can play to the strengths, play together, don't let egos get in the way. I think, I think they're the winners of the tournament. People talk about England. Obviously, England, as we spoke about, middle to front, or top top players throughout the team. Back lines questionable. In France, it's there's no weaknesses in that team whatsoever. So I just look at France as the favourites. Maybe pressure, but these players play for Real Madrid, play for top teams. They rely on pressure. They've always been under pressure and they always come at the winners. So I just look at this and think it's France's tournament to lose. Callum, who's your kind of team to beat in the tournament, do you think? My favourites to win the tournament, um, I agree with Scott or France. I think Kylian Mbappe is the best individual player who's going to be playing at this tournament. I think he's a an exceptional footballer. Obviously, he's now secured that move to Real Madrid, and you know that makes them an even more formidable threat in European football in the years to come. But you know, I think the experience of Qatar and and obviously coming up short against Argentina in the final will will drive them on. Um, you know, they've got strength and depth, as, as Scott's alluded to, and for me, they are a team that you know will 
really, you know, be the team that when you're walking out the tunnel against them, I think you'd be looking around at some of the names um, and, and players in each position and think, you know, we're in for a, a tough shift here. Um, aside from France, I would also pick out Germany. You know, obviously, home tournament for them. They've also got some really talented players. Um, the two in particular, I really want to see you on this kind of stage. Florian Wurtz just off the back one in the, the, the Bundesliga, of course, with Bayer Leverkusen, a phenomenal young talent. Um, I was at Celtic Park a few years ago when Leverkusen played Celtic and even then, I think he was only maybe 18 at that point in time and he was still the best player in the park by a country mile, you know, and he's only continued to grow even with a, an injury setback in recent years as well. I think Jamal Musial is another one who, you know, will be crucial for um, Germany and, and uh, as well as having those exciting younger players, you know, you look at the likes of Thomas Muller who's still in around the... The, the squad for them, you know, they, they, they've they got players to Stegen and goal. They've got experienced players that have been there and done it for their country in the past, but they've also got this crop of exciting young players and a home um, crowd backing them in every single match that could that could be formidable. So France and Germany would be my two favourites. Um, I think if you had to push me, I would say France would be more overwhelming favourites, but I just think Germany, you know, with the uh, home advantage could could go very far. Kevin, who stands out for yourself in terms of kind of teams to beat in the tournament? Yeah, I want to say somebody different other than France, but France, I'm afraid. Um, I think, like Scott said, if you look at their squad, it's just the the depth, the squad depth is insane. You know, I saw one of their the provisional squads, and you're looking at it going, they could probably pick two squads out of that that you would think would be contenders to win the tournament. You know, the, the second string would be up there. So, for me, uh, I share Scott's point of view in that one. This is France's tournament to lose. I think they have to go into his favourites. And they've got so many big game players and big personalities that can't see past them. I really can't. But let's say someone else, eh? Callum's got Germany's one to watch. I'll say Spain as well, being another team that should be good to watch. Um a lot of good young players, exciting yeah. talents in that squad. Guys like Lamine Yamal. I mean, I watched him last year at the under-17s out here in, in, in Hungary. And you could tell that he's just a player that's got the world at his feet. You know, he's he's different class. He's only 16 years of age, but he'll be somebody that I think will set this tournament alight if he gets the chance. So I'd, I'll say Spain's a team to watch as an outsider. Um, but I, I share the, the same view as Scott and Callum that it's France's tournament to lose. Tom, who's the, the standout team to, to beat apart from England? Yeah, we're definitely an echo in here. Obviously, it's France. Um, I think a, a testament to how good their squad is is the players that are missing out for them that haven't made their squad. It's just It just shows the quality that they have, that they have some players who are phenomenal, not even in, in question. Do you know what I mean? Um, they're also... the. the you look at the team, there's so many winners in that team. You know, he, he, he look at, you know, the, the goal scorers for England and France, right? Harry Kane, Mbappe. Who's won more trophies? A lot, lot more trophies. <laughs> Mbappe. And it just, yeah, I'm terrified about playing France. Uh, let's be honest. They're, they're probably, probably the best national team in the world right now, I would say. I know Argentina beat them, obviously, in the World Cup, but I think... France started really, really slowly, which was a bit of a surprise to everyone. And but it, if you're looking at their, you know, we don't think there's a weakness. I think their only weakness is how cocky they can be, because they do win, because they have, they, but they have a lot of egos in that team. And I think that's the only flaw I think in their team is is the potential for some egos to get a bit big. I mean, Mbappe is very well known for, you know this is my team and there's a lot of very, very good players on that side. So we shall see. I do really like the look of Germany. I do really like the look of Spain. I think both have some very good young talents coming through and I think they will be probably next tournament where I'm saying they have a very, really strong chance. They have a very good chance now, but I think that, I think France just have it really. Um, even, I know I said, I know I've said, I'm probably going to get onto who I think will win. And I might contradict myself a bit with that one, but um, I think France's squad is just, it's a joke, really. 
Nima, in terms of Germany, obviously they go into the, the tournament as a host nation. They've been disappointing in the past few years. They didn't get out of the group in the World Cup the last two two times. England beat them at the uh, the Euros the last time out. There's a, there's been a feeling that they're in the middle of a transition, but you look at their side now and you think this could be the time. They've got a lot of pressure, as, as Callum says. Wurtz and Musiala are two super, superb attacking talent that could really carry them for the next kind of eight, ten years. Where do you stand with Germany? I think Germany hasn't won it since 1996. Um, and, uh, well, it's like, except for the one that final they lost to Spain, it's not really been that good for them in the Euros. And this is a tournament that they usually dominated back in, you know, before. I think I look at Germany as, I mean, the, the absolute favourites, overwhelming favourites are France. And then you have, you know, you have England. Uh, and and Germany, um, um, those are the three main favourites. I think England's defence is not good at all. Um, I think Germany have are, are better in those areas in both defence and in goalkeeper. Yeah, and goalkeeper. Um, and going forward, they've got ridiculous attacking talent and and also the home advantage. And and I think g- given how how it's been these last few years with all the arguing and all the scandals that have been going on. In 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 German or surrounding the national team football national team, I think they will. There's an element of pride here, and I think they will. And also, you have Tony Kroos, who's, who's basically going to retire from football after the Euros, um, who I think has had a fantastic career. He will also want to, you know, leave a mark. You know, um, you know, if he, you know, leave a fight, you know, a goodbye mark on this team. Um, by winning it, so I wouldn't. For me, for me, it's it's France and and Germany that are the main favourites. I think France by far. They could literally start three starting formations, three different starting elevens that we really couldn't tell you which one was the better than the other one, which is ridiculous in terms of depth. But um, so I think it is theirs to lose, and I think, but their biggest weakness is Didier Deschamps. I think England's biggest weakness is Gareth Southgate. Whilst Italy's strength is that they have the best manager in in the tournament in Luciano Spalletti, tactically no one comes near him, um, and 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 so that speaks for them. But at the end of the day, as much as how you need to have the quality there, and I look at, you know, I look at Germany, like I look at Nagelsmann, I look at that squad, and I think no, I I'm, I I'm, I I can't shake off the feeling that they could be a really difficult team for 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 many for many other teams. It could be a very tricky side to play. Um, but yeah, France Germany final is is the feeling. I have two teams that I, I quite fancy, and I think I'm I'm gonna kind of get just get a ground and see if there's any of these teams that kind of catch your eye. Like I think Portugal's depth is as strong as it's been. I think this is the first tournament where we're not totally relying on Ronaldo. I think the Dutch have got a lot of attacking, exciting talent. The likes of Avi Simons, I really like. I've also think like Frimpong, obviously Callum and Kevin will know well from, from Celtic has kicked on massively. They're so good at the back. Maybe lacking a goal scorer. Belgium, I think this is a last chance. Like De Bruyne is still just miles ahead in terms of the talent he has and he's so key to that side. Croatia, again, Modric is just so key. Scott, any of those four sides jump out he wants to watch? The Netherlands? I, well, I was going to speak about Netherlands and I'll touch on Portugal as well because then you mentioned them. I was looking at Netherlands' defence. Their centre-half depth is a joke. Van Dijk, Daily Blind, De Ligt, Van de Ven. These, these are, I would say that's almost the best centre-half crop at the tournament. Obviously, you have France with McCann, Saliba, etc. But Netherlands are far behind that. They've got Mickey Van de Ven, who's been one of the best centre-halves in the Premier League this season playing left-back. That's how good their depth is across the defence. And the the phrase always is attack gives you headlines, defense wins your trophies. That's the although I don't know how much I believe that, but that's the phrase that everyone says. And I look at Netherlands' defensive depth as one of the best at the tournament. And also, touch on Portugal. I mean, I think Neymar kind of touched touch on this as well when he's talking about managers. I think Portugal's sort of weakness is Bobby Martinez. I've never rated Bobby Martinez mm-hmm. as a manager. And I think, same way England, I've never read Gareth Southgate. I think Derry Deschamps being a World Cup winner is mental to me. So I think, when I look at managers, I think Bobby Martinez, if Portugal are going to do anything, it'll be in spite of their manager. Mm, but indeed. I look at Netherlands, 
talk about dark horses later on. I think Netherlands could be a dark horse for this tournament based on the you spoke about the attacking the you talk about that attacking depth. I think the depth at the back is yeah. one of the best at the tournament. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think the likes of Ruben Diaz, Cancelo, and even in midfield, I really like the boy Neves at Benfica. He is going to go and be a top player. Alinea looks to be going to Bayern Munich. Like They are so stacked in every position. Callum, out of the four teams I've mentioned, who stands out to you? I think out of the, the teams you've mentioned, Portugal, I would say, um, stand out. The only downside they could have is the Ronaldo sideshow, which... Um, no doubt will follow them at some point if he's substituted or he's on the bench. You know, the, the focus from a media perspective, um, no doubt will be on him. Um, even if he was to say something in a press conference or, or something like that, you know, it could destabilise things. The team out of them all um, there that might surprise you that I don't particularly think have got a great chance actually is the Netherlands um, at this tournament. I think Frankie de Jong, there's... Uh, Frankie de Jong, sorry, there's um, talks about whether he's fully fit or not. Yeah. Van Dijk doesn't perform at the same level for the national team as he does at club level. We've seen that in the past with many players um, over the years, particularly with England. You think obviously Gerard Lampard and others. Um, I don't think they've got a, a striker who is of sufficient quality. Um, you know, without Vekhorst is still in around the squad. They've also got Brian Bobby as well um, in the striking position, but they don't have a a number nine of the class that they've had in the past. You know, they've been renowned for, for great strikers and forward players over the last sort of 30, 40 years. You think you're Van Bastens, uh, Van Persie, Van Nistelrooy. Um, you know, they don't have anyone on that level. Um, and for me, even when the goalkeepers, you know, for Bruggen's probably going to be the starting goalkeeper at the mm -hmm. tournament. He's had a, a good season at Brighton, but he's still a young goalkeeper learning his way. And I, I don't know, I just don't think... You know they're going to have the the, the tournament um, that would put them on par with teams gone by. You know, and then the likes of Robin and Schneider and others. Um, you know, it got to that World Cup final in, in twenty ten. So I think although they have got exciting players like Simons, as you mentioned, who I think is an absolutely fabulous player. I just think the 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 situation surrounding the fitness of De Jong, um, the lack of a real quality number nine, are what I think may hold them back. But you know, I'd be, I'd be happy to be proven wrong, but from the teams you've mentioned uh, there, I would say Portugal would be the most exciting of those four, in, in my opinion. Kevin, out of, out of those four sides, who's the standout? Yeah, um, I'm in agreement with Callum on that one, actually. Uh, it's Portugal for me. Um, I share the, the same views in the Netherlands. That It's a really good squad. It's talented. Like Scott says, the defensive, defensive depth is there. But I'm not sure they've quite got the, the goal scoring threat that will take them through a full tournament. Belgium's a team that's kind of just gone under the radar for me recently. Uh, they had that, you know, it's an overused phrase, but they, they had that golden generation a wee while ago. And now it seems to have fizzled out. Um, so potentially, that's just me being ignorant to them, but I, I don't see them maybe being that strong. And Croatia will always be there or thereabouts, I feel. They're one of those teams that. They're definitely more like the the sum of their parts rather than being built around key players. But Portugal's the one that excites from those four. I look at some of the players like Rafael Leao, João Neves, Ruben Diaz, even Diego Jota from Liverpool. There's, there's talent in there. Uh, I think it was Mourinho himself actually said recently, it's like this is the most balanced Portuguese squad that's been for the last decade or so. Um they seem to be able to now cope that Ronaldo's not going to be around forever. They've got a progression plan to replace him. So I think they could be a dark course in the tournament. But they do need to watch out for, again, like Callum said, it becoming the Ronaldo show. This has got to be his last major tournament on the international stage. At some point, you can just imagine he'll want to make it all about him. And then that could be to the detriment of Portugal going through. Tom, who's the kind of... Best of the rest, do you think? Like those kind of four sides we mentioned, we'll get into kind of other dark horses that could be a spring a surprise when we get to our predictions. But who's the kind of out those four who thinks got the best chance? I I really like the look of Netherlands. Uh, I think that defensive structure and the defensive players they have, like they're not going to be starting some players who are phenomenal in that defense. I mean, do you start uh, Dumfries or Frimpong, or do you play Frimpong further forwards? Uh, you probably play an Ake at left back, and then you've got De Ligt, Van Dijk, Van Ven, and I do. I don't think it's always the case, but 
defenses can win a trope, like they win trophies, they win tournaments. And then if they can just keep that defense as good as it is, they do have goal. They've got Gakpo, they've got Marlon, who's on his day really good. He's not all, not been great for, for Dortmund of late, but on his day, he can be very good. Depay is a goal scorer. You know, Xavi Simmons in that midfield, he is phenomenally creative. And if they can keep the ball out their net for most of the game, I give them a chance in most games. Obviously, they're in a group with France. So I, I think that France game is going to be a real tell for sure. Um, even if they come second in their group, I think that they're going to come to be the other two sides in their, in their group. But um, yeah, I mean, look, Poland and Austria, you know, they have some good players, but I don't think anyone really thinks that they're going to get out of this out in the in the first two spots in this group in the group D, but um, yeah, I think Netherlands actually. Now I've been thinking about it, they do have a lot of depth in more depth than I thought actually, especially in that defensive area. Neymar, probably yourself out the four sides we've mentioned. Who do you think's got a chance? Well, I think I think there's there's good play. I think Portugal is a team that qualitatively is the best, but Roberto Martinez is a case study of how you fail upwards. Um, in your career without having any discernible talent. Um, the same thing with Ronald Koeman, how that man still has a, is, is employed is, is, is a mystery. It's, it's, it's something that should be studied in labs. He's utterly useless. He's failed everywhere he's been uh, for the last decade. Um, and I mean, just look at the fact that he left Joshua Zirkse at home and and his, and, and <laughs> when, when Netherlands I don't exactly have the depth and attack the, that they used to is is another testament of that. You know, it's I I, th I really think it, these things matter. Um, so no, I, I I say qualitatively Portugal, but Roberto Martinez. It's like you know after he ruined Belgium's golden generation, now it's time to go ruin Portugal for a decade and then see what else he come, gets up to. But hopefully Mourinho will. Will take over that Portugal side after his Turkish adventure comes to an end. Right, we're going to go around the panel and just get our kind of six big kind of predict predictions. We've got winners, dark horses, player, young player, top goal scorer, and biggest shock. So we're just going to go around the panel. I'll go last. I'll go let Scott go first. Who wins the tournament? France. Callum. France. Kevin. France. Tom. England. Neymar. Mm. Germany. And I am going to go for Portugal. I know what you're saying about Roberto Ooh. Martinez, but I just think that depth is frightening. Ooh. And I I can see Rafael Leal taking over the Ronaldo role. I think he's just going to just march on. I thought he had a terrific season this season at AC Milan, and I think he is the sort of player who can just take over that role. I don't think they're reliant on Ronaldo as they have been in previous years. I think Portugal were the, the team to, to beat. Dark courses. So teams we haven't mentioned, Scott, who do you think that we haven't mentioned could cause a start at this tournament? Hmm. I'm going to go Croatia. Okay. I just think that. I just think, obviously, Cruz is, Cruz is retiring. Modric probably hasn't got a year probably has only got a year or two left at the top level. I think he's gonna drag Croatia to maybe a quarter final. I'm not sure about the route. I need to check out the route, but I think there's a good chance Croatia could make it last eight because of Luka Modric. Callum, who's your kind of team to, to keep an eye on that we, we maybe haven't mentioned? My bold prediction is that Austria will finish second in their group behind France. I think they'll finish ahead of the Netherlands and Poland. Um I just, I've just got a feeling about Austria that they're going to perform well at this tournament. Not ridiculously well that they're going to do a Greece in 2004 or anything uh, you know, like that, but I certainly do think they're going to progress through the group. Kevin, who's your team to keep an eye on? Uh, for someone that we haven't mentioned so far, because I would say hungry otherwise, I'm, I'm going to throw in Denmark. Okay. Aye. Well, you know, I'm looking at the group and it's... I think they've got a chance against Slovenia. Serbia are not as great as I think they they could be. They'll obviously beat England when they play them. So um, I, I think Denmark, they, they can get through that group and then you just never know in knockout competitions. Tom, who's your team to watch? I think Ukraine, honestly. Um, you know, Dovbik, he scores a lot of goals. Um, if Mudrik can, uh, can turn up, 
attacked, then you know that's their attack looking pretty solid. And their groups, like they look quite likely to get out of their group. I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, Slovenia, Belgium, Romania. I don't see why they couldn't top that. Belgium's probably their their toughest opponent. I don't see why they couldn't top that group. Um, Belgium probably have just a bit more quality, but you you watch Ukraine play, and they've played for each other. I've seen a couple games in their friendlies and, and before this. You can tell that the players play for each other. You know, Zinchenko, Mikhailenko, you know, there's some good... Yarmolenko's, you know, very, very experienced and brings a lot of experience to quite a young... Some quite young players, but very, very talented players in that Ukraine squad. Um, Lunin in goal as well. I mean, he's just won a Champions League. So, I mean, it's, I don't see them going all the way, but I think they're definitely a dark horse. Nima, who's your team to watch? Um, I think um, for me, uh, the dark horse are Croatia. Um, that midfield, Brozovic, Kovacic, Modric. I think they can. They they are unbelievable with the, with the football. Uh, they can do all, all sorts of things. So, yeah, if 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 there is to be a surprise winner, I think it'll be Croatia. But it wouldn't really be a surprise given what we've seen from Croatia in the last international tournaments over the decade. Tom's stolen my Ukraine's under. I think Ukraine have got a very good chance of topping their group. I do not think Belgium are that good at all. Slo Slovakia and Romania, I don't think are up to much. I think Ukraine have got a very good chance. I think Mudrik could have a really good tournament. I think he needs it badly just for confidence. I think if he could have a good tournament, you might see a different player next season. Another team I quite fancy to do pretty well is Serbia. I think, well, obviously they've got Mitrovic as well, but let's not ignore how good Vlahovic has been this season. I think he's been terrific for Juventus, and I think he is, probably won't start, or maybe will start as part of a two, because Mitrovic is so well relied upon, but I can see Serbia finishing second in their group mm -hmm. and getting out the their group. They will play, I believe they'll play the second in Scotland's group, which would probably, if Germany get through, I mean, they'd probably have a good chance of reaching the quarterfinals if they finish second. I've got a big, big feeling that Serbia could be pretty good to watch this season. Scott, who is going to be player of the tournament? Well, I think with I've also said with France winning it, I think you can't look past Mbappe. Like the world's eye, the world's eyes are on him at the moment after his Real Madrid move, and I just think, I just think he's going to take this tournament with a scruff of the neck and show people why. He will be the best player in the world. If not, he already is the best player in the world in the next few years. So I'm going to go Mbappe. Callum? I'm going to agree, I think. Because of back France to win it, if they do win it, I think Mbappe will be a big part of that. So it'll be him. Kevin? Uh, same answer from me and same thought process. I think you just need to look at the World Cup final from the last time there. He's, he's hat in that game. He almost single-handedly won France that tournament. And I think he could do it again this time. Tom? As I've got England winning, uh, I'm going to have to go with Mbappe's new teammate, uh, Jude Bellingham. Nima, who's your player of the tournament? I think I think, um, I think think Jude Bellingham is actually going to be the top goal scorer um, for, in the tournament. But I don't think... I think... Uh, I, I, I think player of the tournament um, is going to be Mbappe as well because I think he's going to play at a level that's ridiculous, even though I have Germany winning it. Uh, I think the, the the level that Mbappe will play at will be so high that I think they'll just give it to him as the best player of the tournament. But I do think Jude Bellingham will be the top goal scorer. I think it will be Mbappe as well. I think I've got the top goal scorer as well. I just think he will be so ridiculous again. I remember having that conversation with people after the, the World Cup final. He scored three goals in a World Cup final and didn't win it. That just shows the character of him, like, to do that and then still not. I mean, he's just a frightening talent. Who's a young player to keep an eye on, Scott? Who do you think will be a young player of the tournament? Well, I've got Germany going quite far, so I'm going to go with Bucks. Okay. I think for someone that age to come back from that bad of an injury and still be to the level he was before the injury, maybe even better, playing... I don't, I don't I think it'll one more season at Leverkusen before he goes to a Bayern Munich, a Real Madrid, a Man City, a top top, a top top club like that. I think you're looking at another year. I think I'm gonna go Vuts because I just think Germany will far home tournament and obviously a 
him being ages, he's a top, top football player. Callum, who's your young player of the tournament? I agree with the thought process on Verts, but just to mix it up, I'll, go, I'll put Musiala in. Um, although, you know, Verts, I think, is a phenomenal player and, and I would agree with Scott, but I'll, I'll throw Musiala in just to mix it up. Kevin, who's your young player of the tournament? Right, finally, I get to mix things up and have an, an original thought here, and I'm going with Lamine Yamal. Okay. I just think he's a phenomenal player. Like I said before, I watched him the under-17s last year. He was different class then. He stepped up into the, the first team at Barcelona this season and looks like he's been playing there for a decade already. So I think he'll be the, the young player to watch. Tom, who's your young player of the tournament? I was going to say Yamal, but that's been said. So I'm going to try and think of someone else. Um, probably is going to be Yamal. Uh Although I do think if Germany do do as well as we expect, it will be Fertz or Musiala. I think, yeah. Nima, who's your young player of the tournament? I've, I've, I've got Florian Witz. I think he is just ridiculous. He's having an unbelievable season. And and I think this, these things matter. I mean, these things matter. Um, good form and confidence. And Witz is playing at a ridiculous level. Yeah. A player I really like, and I think he could be a very good impact sub and eventually make his way into the side for France. Warren Zaire Emery, I think, could be a mm. frightening talent. I Absolutely. really like him. He scored his scored in his debut for France. I know it was a 13 now win against Gibraltar, but you cannot ignore what he's done at PSG this season. I think coming off the bench, he could be a very good light for likes of for Griezmann at times. I really think he could be a standout in this tournament. Top goal scorer, Scott. I've said Mbappe's going to be player of the tournament, but I'll switch it up. I'm going to go Harry Kane. Okay. Because I just think, I don't think there's a better penalty taker at the tournament than Harry Kane. And I think that's important when it comes to these kind of tournaments. Certainly the last tournament, he got most of the goals from penalties. So, I'm going to go Harry Kane to be top goal scorer. I think England will go far, and they'll go far because of the goals from Harry Kane. Callum, top goal scorer? Mbappe, I think, as I say, he'll be player of the tournament, and he'll get the golden boot mm. to go with that. Kevin? It's not Tommy Conway or Barnabas Varga. I'm going to go with Mbappe. Tom? Uh, I agree with Scott with Harry Kane. Brilliant. Nima? Jude Bellingham, I think he's going to show show once again why I think he will be, a, if not win it this year, then in the years to come, he will be in the Ballon d'Or discussions to win it because I think he's been unbelievable. Uh, I think he's a remarkable talent. But yeah, no, I think he'll be the top goal scorer, but I still think Mbappe will be the uh, player of the tournament. Yeah. I'm going to go for Mbappe as well. I just think he's frightening. I think he's, I wouldn't rule out Marata. As well, because I don't know in Spain side if Spain are to go far, I don't see many other Spain players contributing in terms of goals. So I, I with about we each way bet in Marata if it was I mean, what's the biggest shock? What can we see been a bumper prediction, Scott? Give us a one that we could maybe look back in a couple of weeks in a laugh or praise to the hill. What could be a big shock you could see happening? I'm actually gonna steal I'm just gonna steal answers from someone who said earlier. I didn't even think of the, I didn't think of it until they said it, but I think Ukraine will go far. I can see Ukraine hit a quarter final. I'm stealing that from someone earlier on, but just when they mentioned like the players they had, obviously I don't want to get into what what's happening, but that could also play a factor in terms of the rejuvenation in the squad. I think Ukraine could go far. That's my shock. Callum, what's your big shock prediction of the tournament? England go through the group, but the performances aren't convincing and the exit at the quarter-final stage in Southgate leaves very quickly like Hodgson did in 2016. The defence is nowhere near good enough to compete with the top teams and although I think they'll score goals, I think they'll concede a number of goals as well. Um, the defence just doesn't fill me with confidence from England's mm. perspective. I think Southgate's done a really good job in the sense that he's probably performed above his level as manager of England so far. Eventually, the form will go back to, to where it is, and I think um, he'll have a tournament that probably merits his managerial ability, and that will be this tournament. Kevin, what's a big prediction for the tournament? 
Yeah, I mean, I was looking at the groups before and I was thinking uh, Italy not making it out the group mm. could be on the cards and, and a bit of a shock. But rethinking that one, that there's the third place uh, opportunity to go through as well, that, that may not happen. But actually, there you go. Italy not making it out of the group because they can't even qualify as a, a best third place team. Best in Tom, what's your big shock prediction? I, I, do, I agree with Ukraine going far. Definitely. Um, but I'm going to go kind of on the same vein. But what might seem more shocking is Belgium not making it out of the group. Yeah, Nima, Nima, what's your big prediction? No, I'm, I'm, I think the shock of the tournament will be that Italy failed to beat Albania, and as a result, will not go through the group. Will not go through from the group. I think they will struggle, unfortunately. I would be again. It would be, would be very, very strange if if Italy weren't to get out the the group. But my big prediction is I don't think Belgium will win a game. Hmm. I think they're in the easiest, it looks like the easiest group on paper, but I just think they're going to really struggle in that group and I can see Ukraine going quite far in it. But mm. I think this could be a very, very exciting European Championships. I think we're in for an absolute treat. And to my panel who have joined me in this show, it has been an absolute pleasure. First of all, thank you to Scott Young. Yeah, not just for having us on these. I always enjoy Talk about football and and do it with some guests as well. And I really enjoyed this. It's been a pleasure. To Carl McFadden as well, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Kevin McCloskey, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on. Thanks, Ron. Cheers, Scott. Thanks for having me. Tom McCleave, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It's been uh, it's been great. I'm looking forward to the Euros. And to Nima, thank you very much for your analysis. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone that's tuned in. We will be back on Friday night on our all our networks for a post-match reaction to Germany versus Scotland. And we'll have nightly podcasts after that, after every night, to recap on what's been happening on the previous day. Thank you very much, folks. Enjoy the Euros, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.